Hi, this is Eric Brustowski, and welcome to another session of EP on EP. Uh, with me today is a friend of mine for decades and a very prominent member of our community, Dr. Ken Ellenbogen. He's currently president of the Heart Rhythm Society, and he is the uh, Kimberling Professor of Medicine at VCU. Uh, Ken, welcome once again to the show. Thanks, Eric. It's great to be here with you. Now, this will shock you, but I'm going to talk about conduction system pacing with you. <laughs> Sounds so, great. You've done so much work in the conduction system and the physiology, so it's quite fitting to talk to you about that. Well, that's very kind of you. I actually grimace every time you guys put put the wires into my favorite conducting system. But, but it seems like you're working out really well. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to go through a series of points with this. You've done so much work in this area. Let me start with a sort of kind of very basic question. Um, for years, you know, we paced in the RV. Everything seemed acceptable. And then suddenly we're now doing uh, conduction system pacing. Can you, can you give us a, a sort of a reason why that would be different and better? Yeah, that's a great question. For, for decades, almost for, you know, the beginning of pacing to the late 1990s, RV apical pacing was great and particularly when we had AV synchrony. I don't think people realize for a long time that there is a spectrum of diseases which we call pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. Probably in the most flagrant cases where you put a pacemaker in, they're pacemaker dependent, their EF was normal, you're pacing 100% of the time, and then their EF goes down 10 or 15 points and develop clinical heart failure. That is probably not so commonly recognized in, in that it just doesn't occur quite as often as some of the more subtle presentations or, or less obvious presentations. For example, people have an EF of 55 or 60%, then it goes down to 50%, not flagrantly abnormal, but significantly and absolutely different from their prior echoes. Patients who develop symptoms of congestive heart failure, their end terminal pro BMP level goes from you know, 200 to 1,000. Why is that? So there are all sorts of levels of pacemaker-induced uh, pacemaker syndrome. And I think it became, because that phenomena is related to the amount of pacing you do, it's related to the pace width of the QRS, but it's also related not just to the burden of pacing, but to the susceptibility of the ventricle. And so it really became obvious during the era when we started putting dual, IC, dual chamber ICDs in. And it really was studies like uh, David too, where you take patients with dual chamber ICDs and you are ventricularly pacing them. They're, those patients are much more susceptible to developing pacing-induced cardiomyopathy because they already have a pre-existing cardiomyopathy, that people really began to see more and more of this and began to move from the realization that maybe we, when we can't always minimize ventricular pacing, when we get to ridiculous AV intervals like 300 or 350, maybe it's time to think about alternatives. And that's when the whole concept Fortunately, uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy came in, came, uh, was developed in the late 1990s, as you well know. So then we moved from that to actually pacing. I know the initial studies you were involved in were the His bundle, but I think, is it fair to say now when we talk about CSP, conduction system pacing, we're almost always talking about left bundle pacing or am I oversimplifying it? Probably not. There are still a couple of diehards, as there almost always are with everything, that still work very hard to do his bundle pacing. Well, at least in some patients, give his bundle pacing a try. Okay. The problem is, you know, that there are hundreds of thousands of pacemakers implanted just in the U.S. every year. And so whatever procedure is done to convince people to switch from something that's simple and easy to do in five minutes to something that's more complex. You have to show benefit and you have to democratize the procedure so that 90% of people can do it reasonably well 90% of the time. Oh, that's, that's, a good, that's a good lead into where I'm gonna go now. Um, 
let's talk about AV block because that's predominantly, although I know in the United States, when you get, if all you need is an atrial lead, you almost never get just an atrial lead. So we'll go, we'll go it's, it's almost surely you're going to get two leads in this country, right? So, but let's look at two forms of AV block. You have the AV node, and then you have something in the Hispurkinji system. So um, can, can you talk about those two and how you approach it? Or do you, uh, is there a difference or is it really, like you say, is it the, the same thing regardless of the level of block? So if you talk to me, any electrophysiologist five, six, seven years ago, they would say, are you insane? You're going to put a lead in the Hispurkinji system and someone with AV block that is in the Hispurkinji system. So the realization has been that most AV block, over 90% of AV block that's in the Hispurkinji system is in the proximal Hispurkinji system. So actually, his bundle pacing and left bundle pacing capture the, capture the conduction system. And clearly, they have to capture the conduction system distal to the side of block. So that was a misconception that people had for a long time. It's crazy to put a lead in the Hispurkinji system because most conduction system disease is distal. The second misconception that electrophysiologists had was that conduction system disease is progressive. So any idiot who puts in a lead in the conduction system is going to regret it five years or 10 years down the road. So far, that has not really clinically been seen where a patient comes back in with block distal to the side of the pacing lead. Occasionally, patients get exit block. As you know, it happens very rarely. But patients coming in with a functional lead and block, and block distal to the side of the induction system pacing lead would be a case report that I'd like to read. <laughs> It'd probably be one you're right. But um, <laughs> so, knowing you. So here's the thing, though. Uh, as you know, I spent so many years of my career studying AV node physiology. I really hate it when you shove a lead into the AV node that was otherwise okay. But obviously, you're going in that area, and I'm being kind of tongue-in-cheek here, though. So it doesn't matter if the person has um, AV block that's clearly with a narrow curescence in the AV node or if something's in the Hispurkinji. You'll approach that patient in, in the lab when you go in there the same way. You're going to look for the same sites to do the pacing. Is that what I'm kind of getting out of this? Yes, okay. that's correct. Good. So now let me ask you the, the big question. Before you ever get in the lab, I, I there are... I'm guessing uh, ECG signs that would tell you that, you know what, I, I want to, I, I have a choice, let's say, we'll get to the CRT versus in a moment, so I don't want to go there quite yet, Ken, but you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to try to do something to, to improve this person's ventricle, and I can do a CSP, but is there something on the EKG you're going to look at to say, you know what, it's probably not even worth trying? So... Like every like everything, it is always humbling. And I think patients who have relatively classical bundle branch blocks do very well with pacing the conduction system. There are two groups of patients I'm not sure about. Patients who have an intraventricular conduction delay, an IVCD, generally have disease in the distal part of the Hispurkinji system. And so left bundle pacing probably doesn't buy them very much. Probably coronary sinus pacing doesn't buy them very much either. It's interesting, the, com the, the judicious combination of both leads in the conduction system and the coronary sinus can often dramatically narrow their QRS. So those patients, for sure, um, we sometimes think about how we're gonna, we sometimes do what's called lot CRT or hot CRT, mostly lot CRT, which means a lot, a left bundle lead and a CRT lead together. The other group of patients who happenstance, turns out they don't do very well with any sort of cardiac resynchronization therapy, either via, either via coronary sinus pacing or via conduction system pacing, or patients who have fibrosis. And for conduction system pacing, if they had a lot of fibrosis in the interventricular septum, it's often harder to get a lead through the interventricular septum. So 
although our experience with those patients is small, mostly includes patients with cardiac sarcoidosis and patients with cardiac amyloidosis, and obviously there are some non-ischemic cardiomyopathies as well, we struggle more with those patients. We get less QRS narrowing with those patients, and they're just a tougher bunch of patients overall. Um, fortunately, they're only a small percentage of our pacemaker or defibrillator patients. That's great. Thanks, Ken. Now we come to the what used to be called the $64,000 question. For those of us who are old enough to remember the quiz game, for the rest of the younger people, they're going to have to Google it like they do everything else in life. Um, so now you have you have this mindset. The patient's EF is down, you know, uh, and I want to bring it back up. I got two choices, right? I have CRT, which is the classic method. And now we have the new method, both of which, if you read through the literature like I do, I'm not in the lab doing them, um, have uh, data on their side. How do you decide? in a given patient, which which way you're going to go? And are, are there clinical trials that have actually suggested one approach over another in a certain subset? So that's absolutely fascinating. Now, there are a small number of people who are married to conduction system pacing, and it's conduction system pacing at first and always. And as many people who have been in, in our field for a long time will say, well, but the guidelines strongly support cardiac resynchronization therapy with a coronary sinus lead. Is there's we've been doing this since 1998. We have over two decades of data. We have over 8,000 patients in clinical trials. Show me the large clinical trials with conduction system pacing. Sure, there are theoretical reasons why it's better. Most of us are sort of in the middle. We may start off with CRT and then go to conduction system pacing if that doesn't work out. And that's, I think, probably what the most physicians do. They stick with the guidelines. The guidelines give CRT a class one indication. Sounds great. Ken, as always, you're a fountain of knowledge, and I thank you so much for educating the field. And thank you for your service as president of the Heart Rhythm Society. It's been great catching up with you. Thanks, Eric. It's been great talking with you tonight.